Ordered, please. Could members who are leaving the chamber please do so quietly and also guests of the parliament in the gallery please leave quietly. The parliament is still in session. The next item of business today is the members' business debate on motion number 14081 in the name of James Dornan on taking action to protect asylum seekers and refugees across Europe. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on James Dornan to open the debate. Mr Dornan, seven minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming Roscoe Braith from uh, Glasgow to Caring City to the Chamber, but I've got a feeling he's stuck waiting for the rest of the people to leave first, uh, so I, I do know he's in the building. I also want to put on record my thanks to Graham O'Neill and the team at the Scottish Refugee Council for preparing a brief and for all their assistance with this debate. And of course, I'd like to thank all those members who signed my motion and are participating in this debate. President Officer, I wrote this motion some time ago after hearing about the deaths of 70 asylum seekers in the back of a truck close to the Austrian border. This event hit me hard and I was sure that this horrific incident would be the straw that broke the camel's back. That such a tragedy would force the hand of Europe's governments to start working together constructively to offer refuge and asylum to people fleeing the unimaginable hardship of war in their countries. I was delighted to hear on Tuesday that the main suspect in this horrible act was to be extradited from Bulgaria. The involvement of people traffickers in these deaths, as well as countless others, was also another thing that I believed would jolt the EU into action. And I put the remarks by Austrian Interior Minister Johanna mikkel littner into the motion to endorse the idea that we must have a plan to deal with the human smuggling and trafficking that happens wherever there's human misery. Just imagine that your life is so horrible, so full of fear and hopelessness, that you put yourself and your family in the hands of these dealers in death. Coincidentally, part of this afternoon's business is a stage three debate on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill. Very timely indeed. Yet this tragedy didn't turn the tide in the way that I hoped it would when I wrote the motion. That came a few days later with the heartbreaking and tragic image of wee Alien Kordai on the beach. An image I will take some time to go over seeing, and I suspect many others will too. The public response to that image was overwhelming, from donations pouring in from all parts of Scotland, to vigils and fundraisers, to forming of groups such as Scotland Sporting Refugees, and now the Scottish Government and Scottish Refugee Council website, Scotland Welcomes Refugees. The reaction from the Scottish public, third sector, local organisations and most politicians has been swift and unequivocal. Scotland welcomes refugees and we will do all we can to make them feel that welcome, support them and assist them to become part of our communities. In my own constituency of... Cath yes, I will. Alex Salmond. Can I congratulate uh, James Donnan on, uh, on the members' debate? I tabled a similar motion at its heart of saying that we had to, as a country, uh, accept a joint responsibility for refugees arriving in Europe, as well as helping those in the camps in the Middle East. Although it got substantial cross-party support in the House of Commons, it was defeated by the government. Does James Donald agree with me that if this motion, which is the same at its heart as the motion that was tabled in the House of Commons, was able to be voted on in this Parliament, it would carry by a very substantial majority. James Donan. Yes. Uh, it will be no surprise to anybody that I agree with every word that uh, Mr Salmon said. Uh, that's a habit I get into over a number of years. But, uh, and uh, if you listen to my speech, you, you'll hear me coming on to pretty much say exactly that. In my own constituency of Cathcart, the work of Glasgow to Caring City has been nothing short of awe-inspiring. A few weeks ago, I was cont contacted by the Reverend Neil and Roscoe Braith to discuss a shipment of donations they were putting together to go to the Balkans to support those refugees who were attempting at that stage to enter the EU through Hungary to see how we could assist. I immediately contacted Martin Armstrong, Chief Executive of the Wheatley Group, to see if they'd be able to offer any assistance and was delighted when he said they'd give a cash donation to help with shipping costs and make a call to our 2,500 staff to donate clothing for the refugees. Four days after the call went out, Ross and I went to pick up the aid donated by the staff. I was stunned that in that short period of time they donated two tonnes of clothes. A huge thanks is due to all those wonderful people who gave so generously. Yet another example of Glasgow's huge heart occurred in that visit. We were loading the van when this elderly gentleman passed. He stopped to ask what we were doing, and when it was explained, walked on, then turned round and offered us £20. Now, I don't mean any disrespect here. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite is the case. But I doubt he could easily have afforded to give that money. Yet, he wouldn't be dissuaded. He wanted to do his bit. Scotland's response to this tragedy has been full of stories like that. The Reverend Gilbeth told me of a young boy in his congregation who donated a red hoodie 
and in the pocket the young boy had written a letter for the new recipient of the hoodie. This letter and the hoodie are heading to the Balkans and the recipient will see that here in Glasgow there's a wee boy that wants to help. I was pleased to join Minister for International Development Hamza Youssef in a visit to see the great work the volunteers of the Caring City are doing earlier this week. Their hard work and dedication has ensured that over 70 tonnes of clothes and soap are ready to go to the refugees. That shipment will be getting sent to the Balkans early next week and I'm excited to say that I will be in Serbia towards the end of next week to meet the Mayor of Novi Sad and to see for myself the difference the generosity of Scots will make to those refugees fleeing the horrors of their homeland. Of course, the work done by charities across Scotland to help the refugees where they're currently stranded across Europe and further afield is only part of it. We have to be prepared to help when they get here. And I've been struck by the amount of people who've popped into my office offering to help refugees when they arrive. One couple have a spare room they can offer, another teaches English as a foreign language and wanted to volunteer her time. That's why I'm so supportive of the Scotland Welcomes Refugee website. We need that one go-to place for people both offering and requiring support. The website, www.scotlandwelcomesrefugees.scot, is that place. Presiding officer, this is not a motion for attacking the UK government, but I would be derelict in my duties if I didn't take this opportunity to urge them to rethink their policy in this crisis. While I welcome the money they're spending and their commitment to take refugees in, even if it's a miserly 20,000 over five years, the response so far is completely out of step, certainly with what we are seeing here in Scotland and across many other parts of Europe. There's a further meeting of the European Commission in the coming weeks, and the time has long come for the UK to step up to the plate and offer meaningful long-term assistance. In Scotland, we have the room, the resources, the political and public will to help, and I hope that following that meeting, that a broader European strategy can be found that allows us to do even more than we're, capable, that we're able to do just now. Presiding officer, periodically there's, a, periodically there's a tragedy that plucks the heartstrings of the public more than others. It may be because it involves children, because of some horrible photo or video. The longevity and hopelessness of it are simply the pure scale of the horror. This crisis is all these things. The long-term aim must be to make the Middle East a safer place to allow people to return to their home in safety. Because despite right-wing propagandist claims, this is what most of them want to do. However, until then, we as a parliament, as a government, and as people have to step up to that plate to help in every way we can to make life that little bit easier to bear. So far, Scotland has done that and more. I just want to finish off, presiding officer, by thanking uh, again everybody who signed my motion and is taking part in the debate, by thanking the Scottish Parliament for giving me the opportunity to raise this issue, thank the Cabinet Secretary for being here to uh, respond to it, and hope that just by having this debate, we've helped to keep the plight of the refugees full square in the public glare. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Christian Allard. I congratulate James Donner for bringing this uh, most important issue to the Chamber and welcome the opportunity to recognise the many great charities who work across Scotland to welcome and support refugees and asylum seekers. People who arrive on our shores are fleeing unimaginable hardship and conflict and humanity calls on us to see them not as statistics but as individuals, women, men and children who have suffered so much. We see this humanity represented in the work of charities, and I'd like to pay tribute to the many based in the northern Edinburgh and Leith constituency who offer advice, teach English, enable training, and generally help people to settle down in their new community. This includes multicultural family base based in Leith, Sahilia for BME women and girls, and the Living in Harmony group in North Edinburgh. These groups recognise that to come to a new country under any condition is daunting, but to arrive in search of sanctuary from trauma requires extra help, emotional support, counselling, practical advice, and most often, quite simply, a friendly face. We all have a role to play, presiding officer, in assisting the crisis faced by refugees in making the journey from Syria in particular. The Scottish Refugee Council provides a first response for all newly arrived refugees in Scotland, and they have put measures in place that allow the public to fundraise and donate. The Council provide links to a new online hub for people in Scotland to register their support and find out more about Scotland's uh, response to the refugee crisis. ScotlandWelcomesRefugees.org is a fantastic site that includes details of how to donate, with links to all of the charities currently seeking donations, how you may offer practical support, allowing your details to be logged along other expressions of support for future refugees, and also a guide for how to host fundraising events. 
There is such an appetite for getting involved, sparked by the realisation of the full extent of the crisis in shocking scenes from traffickers' boats and the beaches of Lesbos. The Calais phenomenon, which has seen dozens of shipments of clothing and essentials transported to Calais, is testament to this appetite to help, to effect a positive outcome for refugees. In the debate in September earlier, all parties, with the exception, of, I'm afraid, of the Conservatives, called on the UK Government to do more and to extend the number of refugees allowed into the UK and for Scotland to welcome far more than the initial thousand, allowing us to offer a future with inclusive uh, opportunities. The measures required need to reflect the extent of the crisis, and nothing short of an EU-wide strategy will suffice. According to the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance, as of September 2015, over 12.2 million Syrians living within the country's borders are in need of assistance. 7.6 million are internally displaced, and 4.1 million Syrians who have been forced to flee abroad, with most settling in an overpopulated and under-resourced refugee camps in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Iraq and Egypt. The scale of the crisis in these areas is unprecedented, and with the harsh winter approaching, humanitarian organisations like UNHCR have already started to voice their concerns about resourcing. The solution to this crisis cannot be met while party political agendas are being pursued. This requires a cross-party consensus in this country and a cross-border effort that takes a strategic approach across Europe. There are vital talks coming up uh, this month in which uh, the UK must play an active part. We should be at the table talking about how we will play our part in the global mission to ease the crisis of refugees fleeing war. The motion states that for the UK to continue to stand by the sidelines would be, and I quote, senseless and untenable, and I wholeheartedly agree. We have a moral obligation as a country whose repeated interventions in the region may have had some impact on its stability to take on our full quota of refugees. It should be seen as our obligation as a member state in solidarity with others in the EU who are under increasing pressure. We have the resources, we have the infrastructure, and we have the willpower what we require now is leadership. Many thanks. I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Thank you, officer. And I would like to thank Jim Donnan again for, uh, uh, for bringing that to our attention again, uh, the refugee crisis. It's so important that, that we get that at, uh, through today again. And I would like uh, to use maybe another word from another language to say thank you to James Donnan, to say shukran. And why do I want to say shukran is an Arabic word? Because we heard it last night on the BBC. Uh, journalists, and thank you for the, all the journalists who go uh, across Europe uh, to bring us back the images and the testimony of what's happening, this movement of desperate people, of refugees coming across to Europe. And I was struck by the BBC journalist who, when he helped one of his refugees, the refugees answered Shukran very politely. And understanding that, you know, these refugees are people just like us, is what they are. When they left Syria, they were living just like us. And that's very reminiscent of what happened in World War II, is these refugees are people just like us. So uh, I would like to thank Jeff Donnan, but I would like to thank as well uh, the people of Scotland and uh, in the Northeast. I know he talked about the huge heart in Glasgow. We've got a huge heart in the Northeast as well. We may be better to hide it, maybe, but uh, I would like to say that uh, there will be fantastic work with groups like the Aberdeen Refugee Solidarity Campaign and in Dundee, the Dundee Refugee Support. Groups that have originally began their effort to take donation to the Calais camp where really when we started to hear about the refugee crisis. And I would like to say that in, I, I did write to the French president beginning of the year to ask that collaboration between the two governments. That was an opportunity there uh, at the start of the year to address the refugee crisis. Lorry drivers were telling me, I used to work in the haulage industry, and they come back to me and, and they tell me, Christian, this is not... Uh, what we have usually in Calais. This is different. Something is happening. And you know, that refugee crisis happened already there in Calais. And the response of the UK government was exactly what not to do. And, and, and that example from the UK government has maybe been followed by some European countries. Uh, 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 and we heard that again last night in the BBC. But really, 
The UK government started it, didn't respond properly to a crisis. You know, the erection of his fence is, is, is not short when a disgrace. And I would like to say another testimony. Um, I, I saw a mother in Aberdeen, and, and she was so pleased to tell me about the work of her daughter. Uh, that young person uh, is in Jordan just now, and is helping in, the, in a refugee camp. And uh, I said to the mother, you know, please tell the daughter to write to me if she wants to, to, to give me a testimony of what's happening uh, down there. And, and, and she did write. And uh, uh, she, said, she said a lot of things about what the situation was down there. And that bring back what the Scottish government is, is talking about, the direction it's taking, and particularly uh, when, as the first minister said, uh, that it's not an eye of a uh, or approach regarding helping the people in the refugee camp in the Middle East, or helping the refugee uh, which are, uh, who are across Europe just now. We need to do both, and it's very important. Well, that, that point, Christian, yeah, very briefly. Chris Crawford. Very briefly, Christian may be aware that on the 22nd of September, the EU agreed to take an 120,000 more intake from places like Italy and Greece, but the UK and Denmark absolved themselves from that responsibility. Do you not think that was utterly wrong of the UK? Christian, utterly wrong. I, I, I absolutely uh, agree, agree with my colleague there. Uh, you know, this is uh, really an example that the UK government not to follow as started as a start of this crisis. But, but coming back to that uh, young lady, she, she described a number of families and individuals in her correspondence to me, and, and she's, she's asking us, she's asking us on behalf of all those people uh, to help. And it's so important that we do. Uh, and and she, 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 she said, and, and she wrote, despite the aid that it's being given out here, uh, including through money from the UK government, uh, she said it is nowhere near enough. Many women that she has spoken to uh, came through years ago, some of them pregnant, and now with children who have been born in Jordan. And she went and explain as well about the situation of his people. And she said, and I use their word, her words, they are living in awful conditions with poor access to basic water and sanitation facilities. I don't have enough to eat or afford rent. Many of them are evicted and end up begging or selling themselves on the streets for money. This is what it's all about. So I thank again James Donnan for it and for the people of Scotland to respond the way to respond to where we have. Many thanks. I now call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Sandra White. Um, thank you, Deputy Sizing Officer. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate James Dornan on securing time for such an important debate. Refugee crisis, the worst that we've ever seen, that has been unravelling before our eyes, has affected us all in one way or another. And it's important that we debate what the right action is in order to protect those that are the most vulnerable. And... Uh, this morning, the EU committee um, hosted a round table of experts to shed more light on the crisis and suggest what Scotland can do to help. And I praise the many individuals, charities and local authorities in Scotland who are already working with asylum seekers and refugees to alleviate su suffering or stand ready to do so when they arrive in this country. This includes local authorities in my region of the Highlands and Islands, Morag Brown of Argyll and Butte Council attended the meeting this morning. Um, we are a very civilised nation and will, I have no doubt, make the refugees welcome in our communities, as we have done so in the past. I'm disappointed that the motion clearly seeks to shame the UK government, uh, and I reject this notion completely for a very simple reason. Over the past months, the horrendous incidents and accidents with refugees being suffocated in the back of trucks or drowning in the Mediterranean, have caught the eyes of the world, rightly so. Many of these refugees find themselves in the claws of human traffickers. The UK system of going to the camps and surrounding, surrounding Syria and giving asylum to those that are the most vulnerable, we are not only undermining the human traffickers, but also make it harder for individuals from, with malicious intent to enter the UK. Uh, the work we are the world's second largest bilateral donor of aid to the Syrian conflict. That is the UK, and Scotland's part of that. And we have provided more than 18 million food rations, given 1.6 million people access to clean water. We are providing education to a quarter of a million children, and we will increase this number. The UK government announced a further 100 million in aid last week 
taking our total contribution to over one billion. Now, that's the largest response ever by the UK to a humanitarian crisis. So I wouldn't call that standing on the sidelines. And we should be proud of that and proud of the fact the UK is one of the only major countries in the world to honour its commitment to spend 0.7% of its GDP on foreign aid. And the UK is, in my opinion, lucky not to be a member of the Schengen Agreement. The crisis has showcased many of the weaknesses in this thing and the European response to the refugee crisis. The principle of no internal borders relies on the enforcement of an outer border to ensure that Europe remains secure. This system has failed catastrophically and it poses significant security risks and many questions to EU citizens and refugees alike as these gaps in the outer border will have been exploited by those who intend harm. This refugee crisis is heartbreaking and upsetting and I know that all of us can agree with that. But the refugee crisis is a direct consequence of the political situation and violent wars. Therefore, we should sure con surely concur with the UK government and the international community that we must adopt a comprehensive approach that tackles the causes of this problem as well as the consequences. The greatest contribution the UK can make is to work to end the conflict altogether and we must continue to seek a peaceful settlement that enables a political transition and an end to violence However hard that may be, and how far away from that position we might be now, we have to go on that path. And we must take a similar approach towards Libya and other states where political violence and turmoil is harming the people of these countries and driving this terrible refugee crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Call Sandra White to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, like others, I spoke in the debate just uh, two weeks ago uh, in regards to the refugee crisis. And unfortunately, nothing has changed. People being washed up on the shores. And that's why I thank James Donan so much for bringing this forward again to, to speak about. And I do thank very much the Reverend Gilbraith in Glasgow Caring City for the work that has been carried out there and many, many others who I'll go on to, to talk about also. But I can't let Jamie McGregor's contribution pass without comment. We're talking about wars that have been created, and I said this in the debate, by the West. Yeah, we want a, an end to the conflict, but we are morally and duty bound to protect and help these people. And you're talking about stop the conflict. We're talking about the House of Commons going to bomb in Syria once again. So, I mean, I think, really, Jamie, you should look to your own party uh, down in Westminster in regards to what's happening in the unfortunate parts of the Middle East. And another question, uh, you know, I, I ask constantly all the time, who are we to pick and choose who comes to our shores? We pick and choose just people who are in the refugee camps in Lebanon and other areas in Turkey, but the people who are languishing in Greece, in Lesbos, in Cali, we don't open our arms to them. Who are we to say that we can pick and choose who's to come to our country and who we have to help? I find that pretty obnoxious to actually say a thing like that. I want to talk about, obviously, a more positive aspect and uh, thank the many, many people who have helped throughout Scotland. Uh, this week I've been at two events. On Monday night I attended an event in the Yes Bar. Suzanne McLaughlin organised with many, many other people a comedy night in the Yes Bar for refugees for Glasgow's Caring City. And we raised over £2,000 on that one night, which was absolutely fantastic and a great fun way to raise the monies uh, for the refugees. On Tuesday night, I attended a meeting with nearly 400 people, members of the public, at uh, the Charles Wilson Building in uh, Glasgow University. Uh, that was organised by Glasgow Campaigns to Welcome Refugees and many others, SUC amongst them also. And we heard harrowing first-hand accounts from people that I'd mentioned in the previous meeting who were going over to Lesbos and to Athens to actively help Margaret Woods, Pina, and, and others as well. And they gave us the account of what they saw over there on the shores. We had slides, and it was very, very moving. They gave us an account where they watched two boats that was coming in, and they rushed to help. There was a baby that was carried from those boats, who was handed to, to one of the young girls who was helping there, uh, along with Margaret Woods and Pina as well. And that baby was so cold that they didn't know if that baby was going to survive or not. 
Now, the baby did survive, thankfully. We saw pictures of, of her being fed, etc. And these are the real heartwarming stories. These are ordinary people going out of their way. And in fact, out of that 400 people who were in the audience uh, that night, we raised over £1,000 just from the audience. And that money is going straight to Greece to help the, the people on the ground there. And they're also sending a truckload of clothes, etc., to Cali to help there also. And £500, I believe, is going to that as well. And that's the real story of the people on the ground who want to help, who see the suffering. They don't care where they come from. They see these people suffering and dying daily. Some of these people, in Greece in particular, I know they've had their problems, but we had evidence from there that they were being asked to two euros for a bottle of water. Capitalism alive again. They were arriving in from these boats, starving, needing water. They were being charged by some people two euros, and the refugees were giving them it for free, obviously. So that's the real, the real story behind this, and I thank James once again for an allowing us to, to talk about it. The people on the ground want to help the people, and that's what it's all about. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Jim Eady. Thank you, President Officer. And I would like to start off by thanking um, James Dornan um, for securing the time in the Chamber this afternoon um, to debate on what has become Europe's worst refugee crisis since the Second World War. The whole country is moved by this ongoing crisis, with people taking desperate measures to cross the Mediterranean from places including Syria and Libya. More than 2,700 lives have been lost so far this year in an unsuccessful mission to reach Europe in order to seek asylum or refuge. In my own regional area of Glasgow, I am proud that residents are doing what they can to help. Glasgow has now the highest population of asylum seekers outside London. Glasgow's record on providing refuge is the result of a great work of charities and organisations across the city and the, the Glasgow City Council. As I've mentioned in a debate that we had in the Chamber a couple of weeks ago, Glasgow City Council has already provided homes to 55 Syrians who have fled the war in their home country. It has also agreed to take in more, outlining its belief that, that it's simply, simply the right thing to do. It was, I was delighted to see the success of Glasgow Sea Syria event in George's Square, which included drop-off points for food donations from members of the public, and to hear the Council's leader, Frank McAvity, call on the government to accept more refugees. Glasgow University is also to be congratulated for introducing a series of measures to support refugee students, including fee waivers and the extension of the institution's talent scholarship scheme to support refugee undergraduates and postgraduate students. However, presiding officer, we do need to do more. We need to do more as UK citizens and as a European citizen. European Union was founding, founded on the values of respect for human dignity and the protection of human rights. Therefore, we need to establish an agreement between the European Member States and take more positive measures to tackle the crisis of putting people's lives at risk to get to Europe, as well as addressing the plight of those who are suffering in Cali and the other countries mentioned earlier, and those who are displaced in, within their own country. Earlier this week, we heard the President of the European Council at the UN General Assembly to reassure that Europe is as committed to its values and objective, objectives now as it has ever been, and every single one of us needs to ensure that we are committed to these values and objectives as members of the European Union. However, it is shared responsibility among all states, and no single country can solve a crisis of this scale. Yet, the responsibility to solve this crisis does not just lie within Europe. It is a global crisis, and it requires a global response. In conclusion, President Officer, the international community must come together and provide a global response to the ongoing refugee crisis, as we cannot turn our backs 
on people who are seeking refuge from war in their home country. Many thanks. Our final open debate speaker is Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I too congratulate my friend James Dornan for bringing this debate before Parliament. Like other members, I appreciate the heartfelt way in which he urged all of us, both within and out with this chamber, to take action to protect asylum seekers and refugees across Europe. This debate recognises, as other speakers have highlighted, the fact that we are witnessing the largest mass movement of people since the Second World War. And according to the Scottish Refugee Council, 60 million women, children and men have been displaced as they flee persecution, conflict, war, violence and human rights violations. And half of the 60 million people displaced are women and girls. 86% of the world's refugees are hosted by developing regions. Countries such as Pakistan, Lebanon and Turkey alone host three in every ten of the world's refugees. And this debate allows us to highlight the widespread public concern across Scotland at the global humanitarian and refugee crisis. And all of us have been touched and moved by the harrowing images which we have seen in our newspapers and on our television screens. The generosity of the public has been seen in a myriad of ways as people reach out to offer help and assistance. Only last week I met with the teachers and pupils of South Morningside Primary School in my constituency, who were so moved by the plight of refugees that they raised over £1,000 in one week. I would like to pay tribute to them for their outstanding efforts. Another example of the outpouring of public concern has been the response of the churches and faith-based organisations as they have responded to the humanitarian and refugee crisis. Pope Francis has called upon every Catholic parish community in Europe to offer support to refugee families currently fleeing to our continent from the Middle East. So I was delighted to learn that St Columbus Parish Church in Newington have said that they will welcome a refugee family into their community and want to do all that they can to help. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the churches for the moral leadership which they have shown in demanding that governments and people do all that they can to welcome refugees and asylum seekers to this country. Philip Tartaglia, the Archbishop of Glasgow and President of the Bishops' Conference of Scotland, wrote to the First Minister on the 10th of September. In that letter, he stated, and I quote, in support of your response and inspired by Pope Francis, I write to offer the assistance of the Bishops' Conference of Scotland in any plans that may emerge in the months to come to support and assist the new arrivals to our country. Many of our parishioners hail from families with a history of fleeing conflict and poverty in the 19th and 20th centuries to find a new home in Scotland. In the subsequent decades, we have established an effective network of parishes that exist to promote the Christian faith and thus contribute to the common good. However, the generosity of the public response to the humanitarian crisis has not been matched by the actions of the UK government in accepting an appropriate number of refugees from the refugee camps. The UK government did establish the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme to resettle, resettle vulnerable Syrian refugees across the UK. But to date, only 216 people have been resettled in the UK. It is for that reason that I agree with the Edinburgh Trade Union Council when they state that we consider that the UK government's response to the crisis is woefully inadequate. Presiding officer, I believe that the UK government must do more, much more, uh, to meet the obligations to the most vulnerable people on the planet. But the greatest failure of the UK government has been its determination to stand aside from the European Union's relocation scheme. If the European Union is committed to taking 160,000 refugees, should the UK not play its part in accepting its share of those refugees to our shores? The UK is a permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations, but their actions have destabilised uh, the Middle East as a region, and I believe that the UK has a moral obligation uh, to do much more than it is currently uh, committed to doing. Scotland as a national community and as a society stands ready, as we have always done, to open our doors and our hearts to welcome refuge refugees into our country. Refugees and asylum seekers have enriched our society, culturally, economically and socially, over many decades. We look forward to playing a role as part of a coordinated European-wide response as we respond to this crisis and as we help people rebuild their lives. 
Therefore, I look forward to welcoming these new Scots to our country and to them making a positive contribution to Scotland in the years ahead. Many thanks. Can I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to respond to the debate. Fiona Hislop, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to James Dornan for bringing forward the motion for this afternoon's debate. This issue is not new, but the sheer scale, the importance and the impact of this crisis demands both a, a public and a political response locally, nationally and internationally. And also it's generated, as we've heard, a very personal response. And I was very struck by the remarks of James Dornan about the, the young boy in the red hoodie. That uh, response has been felt, I think, across our constituencies um, and across our constituents. And we've heard from Christian Allard and Sandra White and um, from James Eady there and Amit Taggart about the personal contributions that people have been making in their communities. But that's not to say that there is unanimity amongst the entire population about the moral imperative to act. And we know that that is not the case. And therefore, it makes it all the more important that all of us continue to make that case. The fact that over a thousand offers... Uh, yeah. Chris Crawford. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would accept that Scotland in general in terms has accepted the, the crisis of the refugees with a remarkable heart and remarkable direction and want to do something. But the point you just made about the longer term is pretty important here in terms of what integration measures will be available, particularly to bring awareness raising to the various communities across Scotland, not just where the, where the refugees themselves will be potentially based, but across Scotland, so we can raise awareness of the people of Scotland about the sheer scale of challenge that these people have faced. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think that's a very important point. That we are in this for the long term and the long haul. We all have to be prepared and, uh, for, for that uh, event. And the fact that over a thousand offers of help have already been received by the Scotland Welcomes Refugees website and that all 32 of our local authorities have pledged their support to bring Syrian refugees to Scotland and integrate them into our, our communities is testament that Scotland stands willing uh, is able to step up to the plate to help, none more so than the organisations referred to in the motion. My colleague Alec Neill, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensions Rights, has made clear in the debate on the refugee crisis on the 15th of September that the Scottish Government should be doing what we can to help people who have made their way at enormous risk to mainland Europe. The First Minister and the Minister for Europe and International Development reiterated that message when they met Philip Hammond, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, on the 21st of September. And the Deputy First Minister delivered the same message in Brussels on the same day. And although asylum remains a matter reserved to the UK Government, the Scottish Government believes that asylum and refugee resettlement into the EU from third countries are areas which require multilateral and collective action by the EU. The EU must take collective responsibility and exert the leadership that was referred to in Malcolm Chisholm and his contribution. On my part, I have raised the need uh, for solidarity and support for rescue and refuge of peoples from the southern borders of the Mediterranean regularly with the UK government uh, since the Lampedusa tragedy many years ago. The Scottish Government remains firmly committed to continuing to press the UK Government to sign up to measures which will protect vulnerable refugees from harm and ease the burden on countries which are most affected, as we've heard in particular, by participating fully in proposed EU action, such as on relocation and resettlement. The UK Government did not vote, as we've heard, in the Emergency EU Justice and Home Affairs Committee meeting on the crisis on the 22nd of September, as it is continuing to refuse to opt in to the relocation scheme. However, they were initially not prepared to take more than a handful of Syrian refugees, so we know that they can change. But political energy and effort should be spent on supporting those in need and not soaked up by seeking to shift the intransigence of the UK government. And Jamie McGregor, I'm not sure if he meant to do so, seemed to indicate that the UK's interest of self-interest of security was driving the response, not about sympathy, solidarity and support. And that is of serious concern. Now, at the meeting on the 22nd of September, the EU members agreed to relocate 120,000 of the desperate people who have reached Europe. The Scottish Government believes that the UK should take a share of this group too, as well as those from Syria. 
And of course, it is welcome that the UK government has increased their aid to camps in the region to £1 billion, making them the second largest donor there. We don't dispute that there is a, an urgent need to provide aid in the region, as well as to work internationally to try and resolve the current circumstances which are driving this mass movement of humanity. But it's not an either or. We can make sure the support in the region and sign up to relocation within the EU. And I think that's what this parliament wants. We don't agree that the UK is doing all that it can, and we will continue to press that message home. There is much in the EU's agenda that the Scottish Government can support, including its focus on taking action to save lives in the Mediterranean, uh, the recognition that migration to Europe is a complex global issue with its roots in third countries, and the understanding that European cooperation, not isolation, is key. And we strongly support a controlled and managed migration system, and it is essential that we work with our EU neighbours on a shared approach to those challenges that that migration um, affects. What we're seeing currently is almost unprecedented in terms of the mass movement of desperate, vulnerable people risking life and limb to get to places where they believe they can be safe. We're very lucky, presiding officer, to be able to live our lives free from such desperation. We do have our own challenges in Scotland, but we have successfully accepted and integrated thousands of refugees into our communities over recent years. My colleague, the Minister for Europe and International Development, visited uh, Glasgow, the caring city, on Monday with James Dornan. And I know he was amazed at the generosity shown by members of the public who have so willingly donated what they can to help others in need. He will be visiting Lesbos this weekend to see at first hand the excellent work that the aid agencies are carrying out in very difficult and harrowing circumstances. And members will, I'm sure, welcome um, the announcement by Hamza Yusuf earlier today that £300,000 from, from the Scottish Government is being provided to support humanitarian work in southern Europe carried out by the British Red Cross and Mercy Corps and to provide additional resources to Edinburgh Direct Aid and to Glasgow, um, the caring city referred to in the motion. Presiding officer, these moments in human history can define nations. I'm sure I speak for all members when I say I want Scotland to be defined by our compassionate, humane response to this crisis, by our strong leadership on the international stage, and by the warmth of the welcome that we can and will provide to all those who come to our country to escape unimaginable horrors. Thank you. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes James Donnan's debate on taking action to protect asylum seekers and refugees across Europe. Can I point out to members before I close the earlier than usual start, and I now suspend this meeting until 2.15pm.